For most of the past three decades, Afghanistan has been involved in conflict. Soviet invasion, Mujahideen, Taliban, and allied forces. For an entire generation, this country has become synonymous with war. But it hasn't always been that way. I've come to visit the British Museum's latest exhibition with Zia Sharia, an Afghan journalist working for the BBC World Service. For the first time, Zia will see some of his nation's most precious treasures, hidden from view in his homeland for much of his life. So, Zia, the exhibition begins with this rather sort of tantalising fragment. Second century BC, it was discovered in 1971, already rather badly damaged at some point in its history. But then in 2001, the Taliban broke into the Kabul Museum and they took a hammer to the head. Well, and of course, Islam prohibits representations of human beings. There's so much of Afghanistan's history embodied in this object. It shows that, you know, Afghanistan is, uh, you know, much more to what you see nowadays on the TV, you know, a war-torn country. But the, the fact is that it's a very complex country. It's been in the crossroads of, you know, many empires. It still is. Afghanistan has gone through different layers of history, and uh, this is, I think, an example of that. Archaeologists believe that only a fraction of Afghanistan's rich heritage has been discovered. But the finds we do have give us glimpses into a sometimes surprising history. I think what's wonderful about important archaeological finds is that they give us a snapshot of a particular time, a particular place. Here, it's the Greek settlement of Iconum, discovered, incredibly, by the Afghan king himself in 1961. And at the centre of it all was a gymnasium, a place of physical and mental instruction. And guess what? We've got the teacher himself, a man called Strato. And there he is staring at us. Isn't he a great character? He looks a very proud man, a kind of... Uh, you know, tribal leader, you know, that you've got still in Afghanistan, those proud guys with this long beard and, you know, strict views. So I wonder if this image of the strong, powerful teacher might not have a resonance for some young Afghans in the modern world. Education is the thing that you can use to get out of this situation. It's only a small sculpture, but he somehow feels bigger than us. <laughs> <laughs> These objects, a sundial, a gargoyle water spout, a gilded silver plaque showing the Greek goddess of nature. These are the remnants of the most eastern outpost of Greek culture in Asia, established in the wake of Alexander the Great, who swept through northern Afghanistan around 330 BC. This little figure here, Heracles, the Greek version of Hercules, emblem of Greek military might, I suppose, at a symbolic level, he explains how all this came to be possible, this amazing military adventure of Alexander the yeah. Great. He's a very famous figure all over Afghanistan. People name their kids after him. Really? You know, Iskandar. Iskandar is the Persian name for Alexander. They actually call their kids Skandar after Alexander? That's right, because uh, they know that Alexander came to Afghanistan with his army. He captured everywhere else, but Afghans believe that they defeated him. So they've got this feeling of pride about it. The next sort of archaeological time slice gives us a window onto the world of the Kushans, and that's just round through here. The Kushan Empire emerged in the first century AD. Its wealth and art evidence of its position at the heart of an ancient trading network. One day, the Kushan royal family, they put all their precious possessions from their summer palace away into two rooms. They walled those rooms up. And for whatever reason, we don't know, they never came back. But this is their taste. And I think it shows you how plugged in to the rest of culture of that time Afghanistan was. Here they are on the Silk Road. You can almost measure the extent of their trade. You've got objects there from Egypt, beautiful Indian ivories over there, and indeed figurines that show clearly the influence of Greek mythology. And it's the good life. Afghan style. It shows what a high standard of living they had, such a luxurious stuff, and, you know, brings me back always to Afghanistan today, that how poor the common people are. In the 1990s, when Kabul was one of the most dangerous places in the world, the city's National Museum was under constant attack from rocket fire and looters. But when the Taliban came to power, determined to wipe out Afghanistan's pre-Islamic history, 
a nation's precious cultural heritage, was on the brink of total destruction. Hello. Abdullah Hakimzada is a conservator from the Kabul Museum. When this moment of destruction was at its height, how did that make you as a museum professional? How did that make you feel? Not only for me as a museum professional, but every museum professional everywhere in the world can understand this feeling. Me and my colleagues, we were crying sometimes in the museum. Among the most precious objects held in the Kabul Museum was the Bactrian Hoard. Discovered in 1978, this breathtaking collection of over 20,000 intricate golden objects was unearthed from the intact graves of six nomads who lived at the time of Christ. In an act of great bravery, Abdullah Hakimzada and a small group of his museum colleagues took the decision to hide the gold in a vault under the presidential palace. Our colleagues, a few people from the museum as well as the um, archaeology organization in Afghanistan, we uh, had promised each other that we would not tell anybody, even our wives, uh, to preserve these you know, precious objects. For years, the world had no idea what had happened to the gold. But in 2004, after the fall of the Taliban, Afghanistan's president, Hamid Karzai, ordered the vault to be opened. And the moment was captured on camera in this extraordinary footage. How did you feel when at last the gold could come out again? Yeah, it was a very, very uh, cheerful moment and some of the colleagues were even dancing. That they were so happy. The Bactrian gold is like the Afghan equivalent of Tutankhamun's tomb riches. And we can't leave without seeing the exhibition's centerpiece, the crown. So, Zia, what do you think? <laughs> it's pretty stunning, isn't it? It's very elegant, beautiful. And it's so delicate and so fragilely poised that even the least movement of our bodies is making it tremble, which I think enhances its splendor somehow. This is the key to how the archaeologists realized that these were all the objects of a nomadic oh, really? tribe. Yeah, because the great thing about this crown is that it flat packs, so you can pack it away to travel with it. Sadly, it won't be until Kabul Museum is secure once again that the people of modern Afghanistan will be able to see these treasures of their own cultural heritage. I think every Afghan has to see it. It would create a lot of confidence for them. It was wonderful, absolutely. Well, thank you very much.